not exactly the greatest dude to ever live. He was aggressive and violent and overly political, but at least he seemed someone involved in the day-to-day -day running of his kingdom. He had political plots and schemes. He raised the castle. He solidified his little village into a proper town and forged the kingdom of Arendelle himself. At least that's what we learned from the various extended pieces of law. And all of this implies that we're dealing with an old school, absolute autocratic monarchy. All the power is given to one dude who uses he sees fit, and that dude is the king, or the queen in the case of Elsa and then Anna. There seems to be very, very, very minimal bureaucracy in the kingdom, and everything just comes down to this one person. That's the vibe I'm getting. The king. Runard, Runeard, something like that, who cares? And I think this political system is solidified by the fact that when Elsa goes missing and Anna goes off after her, there's literally no person available to step into the role of ruler of this kingdom. And so it's Hans, a random foreign prince who's able to step in and usurp everything and become the regent of the kingdom in like a day, with the goal of killing off the queen and the princess and proclaiming himself the king of Arendelle. Just like that. So clearly, no real lords or prime minister or parliament even exists in this world. There's no bureaucracy that extends beyond the palace walls at all that can make important decisions or mobilize the army or do anything at all. Instead, we have a kingdom full of lemmings who are ever so eager to roll over and accept the foreign rule of this dude that arrived for a coronation a couple of days before and whom the queen didn't even seem to like that much based on their very limited interactions before it all goes bananas. So therefore, all the power to rule and to make decisions seem to rest in the hands of the king slash queen. Otherwise, there would have been somebody there to step up and rule whilst Elsa went off on a little trip to the mountains. But there isn't. Immediately, Wesselton and Hans are somehow able to assert themselves as regions of a realm of which they're not even citizens. And they even go so far as to sentence the reigning queen to death. Like what? <laughs> the only way that somebody could ever be so brazen about that sort of thing would be if they knew for a fact they'd get away with it. Damn. So yeah, you might be thinking, but what does this have to do with the kingdom itself? How does this all mean that the kingdom's built on shaky foundations and is lucky to still exist at all? Well, yeah, I just had to set the scene, right? To show the kingdom is, well, it's already set up to fail. Everything sits directly in the hands of the sovereign, with no council, no parliament, no advisory body inside at all. And that's a lot of work to do. Even if the kingdom itself only seems to consist of a single palace, castle thingy, and the town of Arendelle itself. I mean, there's probably farmland or maybe some other towns and villages, but we never see those, and I don't really remember them ever being referenced. So I don't really want to speculate as to whether they exist or not. But regardless, even something that size would require a lot of work to maintain. Not to mention diplomacy with other nations. You know, stuff that we actually see in the movie itself. Important things. Meeting delegates, hosting them, having functions, talking to your people, your citizens, hearing their issues, setting taxes and budgets, building roads, building houses, all of that sort of stuff. You know, things that actual real life councils do. I mean, nobody wants angry peasants lurking outside your castle because they have no food or houses, right? Know what I'm saying? And this really brings me into the crux of why it surprises me that everybody's so happy to still be ruled by Elsa at the end of the day and then by Anna. Because it seems like the kingdom has only survived through sheer dumb luck. As I previously outlined, we have a fairly flimsy system of government that's held together by sticky tape and dreams. A system that really does rely on the key executive figure to hold everything together, which works for a time. I'm sure it does. First, we have the granddad, you know, the really ruthless and violent one that battled the natives in the woods. And then apparently, according to the extended law, after he got himself killed in the battle with Ian Frozen 2, a regent then rules for his son until he comes of age and takes control fully. And now we're talking about Elsa's dad. That's the character we're dealing with at this point. And that's all well and good. He's a fine king as well. There's always somebody ready to steer the ship. But then we have the birth of Anna and Elsa, which is eventually followed up by Elsa developing her special ice powers, which in turn leads to her accidentally zapping her sister and freezing her heart, which requires treatment by the magic rock trolls, and pretty much kickstarts the plot of the first film. We know all of this. This is just from the movie itself, but that's not what I'm interested in. No, I'm interested in the small fact that it also kind of kickstarts Anna's storyline and pushes that whole adventure arc into action. Because instead of trying to deal with the fact that Elsa had superpowers that allowed her to control ice and snow, her parents decide that the best thing to do is simply repress everything and hope for the best. Not exactly the greatest parenting we've seen for the screen, but eh, I'm pretty sure that according to the wiki, at least, this film's supposed to be set in like the 1800s or thereabouts, so I'm not expecting a miracle when we're talking about parental ability and understanding differences. But part of this repression, you remember what it involves? Yes, it involves the entire royal family, the ruling family of the kingdom, the executive figure of this system of government, locking up the palace. Nobody in, nobody out. And this, like, last years. In the first flashback, Anna gets frozen when she's a very small child. And then the castle closes up. And the idea is that this pretty much makes it impossible to get in to speak to the royal family. Contact between the royals and the peasants ceases. I mean, maybe the king still left the castle and talked to the people one-on-one, -on -one, but it still adds a whole new layer of red tape to get through. And also, I feel like the film really just does imply that they spend a whole lot of time trying to find a way to understand slash cure Elsa's condition, culminating with their doomed voyage where their ship sinks. And say, let's be generous, and we'll, we'll say that he was still involved in the day-to-day -day rule of his kingdom, but now it has to be to a lesser degree, because he's locked up in his palace. If not, you wouldn't be barring the gates to your castle. It wouldn't be such a big event when they get to see the royal daughters again, right? But then he goes off and gets himself killed. Bad luck, mate. Maybe if you taught your daughter to accept herself, this wouldn't have happened to you, but oh well. And so suddenly the dude's dead, king's dead, he's gone, and his daughter is in command, supposedly. And so she's needed to rule over everybody else. We see this in the film. There's nobody else to take over. But how? The film makes it clear that she's a shut-in that never leaves the castle. So who's governing the realm? How is the realm so prosperous and peaceful and happy? Why do the townsfolk love her so much? How does anything get done at all? Do they just live in a state of anarchy? Does she send out decrees via carrier pigeon? Does nobody think, hmm, maybe we should start electing our own leaders and screw this queen who does not give a shit about us? But nope, nothing seems to go wrong. Everything couldn't be better. Life is great in the kingdom of Arendelle, and it doesn't really make much sense. And then she does get crowned, despite the fact that she would have no leadership experience and no idea of how to run things, you have to assume. And the people just accept this. Oh yes, now you can make all the decisions, even though we seemingly have been governing ourselves all this time. And I mean, of course, this has happened in real history. There were some definite smooth brains that inherited the throne in a bunch of European countries in the 1800s. No doubt about that. But spoiler alert, a lot of them got violently overthrown by the people. Surprise, surprise. So already I feel like that could be in her future. But then she goes and unleashes a snow apocalypse, a cold snap that I guarantee killed a lot of people. Let's be real. And yeah, she fixes it. But this was pretty much the worst case scenario her dad was scared of, wasn't it? And on top of that, her actions almost had the throne usurped by random foreign nationals. And nobody in the kingdom seems to care. They know she did it. People saw her unleash the snow. This feels like a worst case scenario. And yet she rules and succeeds and thrives. And the kingdom loves her. She's beloved by all. And then she leaves, leaves to become an ice spirit fairy lady in the woods and gives the rule of the kingdom, not to a democratically elected representative, but no, to her younger, more impulsive sister, Anna. The same woman who was going to marry a dude after a day. The same woman who ran off in once in a lifetime level snowstorm to hunt down her sister. I mean, you think that maybe the kingdom would need you. Need you to fill that gap left by your sister. But no, let's let Hans do it. Sure, this is the guy that gets left in charge. And so now the kingdom's in her hands and the people are supposed to be happy, especially since she's ruling alongside her potentially illiterate peasant husband. Nice. And so yeah, in a world of ice magic controls and fantasy, for me, the most unrealistic element is the terrible kingdom administration that we see on display. For shame. Oh, go figure though. And so yeah, I know this is a bit of a silly video, but I had fun with it. And so with all that being said, these are just my opinions and
uh, I ended up having a lunch. Um, I mean, it's all sort of kitsch. Fascism is kitsch, and I think that also confuses people. They think it's silly and funny, and therefore it doesn't matter. So I had a guac nine hamburger, get it? Guacamole, mm -hmm. uh, or as they call it there, guacamole. Um, I had a guac nine hamburger with a, a, a militia man. And on the one hand, here's the good news, right? This guy is well armed. Um, and he kept saying, we're going to rise up. We're going to rise up when they come for our guns. Well, first of all, um, the Biden administration, I don't think any American government is going to come and take all the guns. Um, that's not going to happen. So great. Meanwhile, this guy believes that Democrats are actually eating children. Well, if that's not enough to get you in the streets, maybe you're not coming out. I don't think. Uh, and with and we should just say, literally thinks that Democrats are eating children like uh, that, yeah. it, like like top leadership is eating. He's full like QAnon, Pizzagate, uh, whatever that uh, sort of. And he's not mentally ill and he's not stupid either. And those beliefs are common. And I almost guarantee you, wherever you are, you may not know it. It may not come up in conversation. You know people. You may even have friends who hold these beliefs. Um, in, in Wisconsin, Marinette, Wisconsin, I spent some time in the home of a leader of a militia, a fairly large militia, militia, an arsenal of guns. And he says, that's only, you know, only the legal stuff. Um, and he was a J6er. He had was streaming footage on his TV of his own footage he'd taken at J6. Um, uh, when does the Civil War start? He says, when the feds kick in his door. Um, but what does he imagine? These are guys who've seen Red Dawn one too many times. Right. To say one time. Um, <laughs> Um, they imagine, you know, up in the hills, they imagine this heroic resistance. Some of this, I'll say, is on the left, too. Uh, I hear leftists saying, I'm not afraid of these guys because we're arming up the John Brown gun club. Or I hear liberals say, well, these militias are in for a surprise when uh, an F-16 comes. Um, and yet, I think maybe one of the most important and overlooked pieces of opinion journalism recently was in the Washington Post, three retired generals speaking to the fault lines within the military. And this is something I've reported on fairly extensively for previous books. Um, uh, it, it, where is the situation? The militia is not going to come marching. There's not going to be Red Dawn in New York or that movie, you know, Texas invades Bushwick. That's not happening. Uh, uh, all these things are sparks. That's why it's a slow civil war, as the real civil war, by the way, was a slow civil war for a long time before it became a hot one. It may never blow up. Nothing is inevitable. Inevitability is, a, is the politics of fascism, or it may become something like Northern Ireland, or we may get a spark where a base commander doesn't know who's really president. Do I believe Trump is president or do I believe Biden is president? Whose orders do I commit? Do I follow? Um, uh, there's enough base commanders, and I've met them and interviewed them, senior officers who are full QAnon kind of folks, um, uh, for that to become a very volatile situation. The chain of command in America is actually quite strong. That's good news. Um, but what if you don't know where the command is? Then we're looking at something far more terrifying. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it'll happen. Um, but not because the center will hold. The center hasn't held. I think because we're going to slowly organize our way into something better, but we're gonna have to go through a lot of that stuff first. Do you think it's generational? I mean, when you went around, um, uh, you know, and at one point you, 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 early in the book, you talk about Occupy, um, yeah. and um, y your critique is, is one that I think, you know, people have heard contemporaneously that it wasn't necessarily um, uh, organized for a specific ask. Oh, that's um, not, oh, no, no, I thought that was a genius of it. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I, yeah. I, I, I note that, um, so Occupy, I mean, Occupy, I put Occupy at the beginning. The, the book begins and ends with some hope. Right, um, yes, that I was gonna say. It, was like, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't say <laughs> it, it, it did sort of right? feel like you didn't want to do it, like, like, yeah. But also because I think it begins actually with uh, Occupy and with Harry Belafonte. And, and like, I know this is gonna cost me book sales. People are like, oh, look, I got this book and it's all about this art, hor horrible time. I'm like, wait a minute, Harry Belafonte, the banana boat guy? Um, and the reason I put him there, I couldn't stand to start with some of the ugliness, but also, um, because I want people to remember this is a long struggle. Occupy seems like a thousand years ago now, you know, when uh, it seemed like we might be on the verge of a real left shift. And remember, Occupy, as you were about to say, they famously didn't have demands, and that drove a lot of people uh, just crazy. I thought it was brilliant, and I thought it was imagination. And right now, we live in a moment where the right has, I hate to say this, a more political imagination than we do. Imagination is another word like social movement. Traveling around the country, it's almost like fascist Americana folk art. I have a friend who's a Smithsonian curator who says, we've got to collect this stuff. They are painting silos, billboards, a uh, 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 hundred different flags, two hundred different flags. Um, Occupy and artists like Harry Belafonte, who's a radical artist. The Banana Boat song, he understood that as a subversive song. The civil rights movement, he bankrolled it. It wouldn't be there almost without him. And he knows that they failed and Occupy failed. Uh, they were defeated. That's not meant to depress us. That's meant to remind us that the struggle is long, that it's not a crisis. It's not the final battle. We will lose and we keep going. Um, and we need to do, do so with imagination and with a diagnosis that I do think is rooted in history. Harry Belafonte suggests that the way we can understand American history and race and American history is through the Minstrel Act, white men corking up, blackface. And he goes further and says, there's ways in which we all do a Minstrel Act in America. That this infection of whiteness, I don't mean white people, I'm a white person. I'm a person who is white, um, but whiteness, white supremacy, uh, just that's part of the undertow. And that's pulling people who would not otherwise be a part of this thing into fascism. So yeah, I think it's important to start there.
Well, do you think, do you think, I mean, as you, as you travel across the country, do you think there is a, um, there's reason to believe that a lot of this is um, generational? 